Shakuntha, sir, you can start. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this webinar by the Destination Knowledge Center. Uh, this webinar is uh, about the Golden Triangle, Delhi, Agra, Jaipur, with the Ram with Ramthambore, which is uh, the home of the gorgeous animal, the Royal Bengal Tiger. Uh, but before we, uh, uh, but before that, let me introduce you to our um, esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, we have Lovleen Sagar, who is uh, the senior vice president and uh, heads the Destination Knowledge Center. Uh, she's sitting in Gurgaon uh, in North India. We have Harpreet Bhatia from our uh, product and uh, procurement division. She, he heads that. Uh, he's sitting in, um, in, uh, in Delhi. Uh, we have Sandesh Sharma who um, heads our North India operations and he's sitting in Jaipur, that's somewhere in Northwest India. And we have Surya Ramachandran, who's actually right now sitting in a national park down south uh, India. And I'm Kuntil Barua, I'm sitting somewhere in the extreme eastern part of India, uh, in a state called Assam. You'll see that on a map uh, as we talk about India on a map. So it's a very exciting people from people sitting in different parts of India and uh, doing this webinar. Thank you, panelists, and uh, thank you, attendees. Uh, let me start this webinar now. Uh, I'm just going to kind of put my video off so that the bandwidth is uh, okay and doesn't hamper with the presentation. Uh, yes, so, Until we can't hear you, I think you've gone mute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, better. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So yeah, let's start with uh, India on the world map. So that's India on the world map located in South Asia, bordering the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal. The seventh largest country in the world and the second most populated country with over 1.3 billion people with more than 200 different ethnic groups. Uh, making it a very special country. Uh, this is India and its neighbors. And uh, these are not our neighbors. They have also influenced our culture in a great way, the way of life, our food, the way we dress. This, 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 uh, they have influenced us in a great way. Can I um, invite uh, our, uh, one of our esteemed panelists, Lovelyn Sagar, to throw more light on this? Because it's a favorite subject to talk about. <laughs> hi, hi, <laughs> Kuntil. Yeah, yeah this, this indeed is my favorite subject and I like to call myself the queen of trivia because I love to see how cultures across, um, across nations and beyond borders have influenced each other. So actually assimilation of our culture began right from the beginning. Uh, Indian civilization existed 55,000 years ago, let's say um, 2500 BC. It is believed that around 2000 BC, the Indo-Aryans arrived from around the Caspian Sea. Uh, they brought the language, the Indo-European language, which has diffused into India from the Northwest, unfolding as the language of the Rig Veda and recording the dawning of Hinduism in India, actually. So uh, we see European influence mostly on our Western borders and coastlines. Uh, we see it in the language, as Kuntil said, in food, cuisine, religions, clothing, art, culture, the list goes on. Um, you can actually see the Greek influence resulted in the central, uh, in the ancient Gandhar art form, where you see Buddha sculptures with Roman Greco curls. Uh, some fine examples are still available to see in the Delhi and the Calcutta museums. Um, it's fascinating to see how Buddha sitting in starvation mode, um, wearing 
almost nothing has these beautiful curly uh, locks on his head uh, that remind you of a greek god um that's gandha raj from you for you and and this happened centuries ago then um at the beginning of the 11th and the 12th century until medieval times the mongols and other central asian communities would come to plunder and go back however the persians came to conquer and stay and they occupied most of northern india as we know it today and and even deccan during their peak they brought with them the tandoor um the tandoori famous uh, uh, tikka that you know and the kebabs that you know and the current present day salwar kameez the you know the pant shirt that we wear the women wear uh, they also brought wheat they also brought biryani <laughs> so some amazing um, uh, influences there and then the seafaring europeans uh, started trading around 10th century towards onwards for spices black pepper was called black gold and the portuguese the dutch french and eventually british all came to india via the sea routes and most people would know that vasco da gama landed in kerala uh, which is near calicut uh, uh, some place uh, today um india didn't know potatoes tomatoes capsicums chilies imagine an indian dish without chilies and a whole lot of other vegetables that came through these trades and also came the recipes so adaptation and modifications were made and we have dishes like the mulugutani soup your railway cutlets stew uh, made with coconut cream dough um, so huge influence there on the coastal part of india by western europeans and the northern part uh, from central asia then india also influenced in return to all these countries that came um uh, to us and also towards the southeast asia so um southeast asia in fact was under greater india from around 290 bc until around the 15th century when hindu buddhist influence was absorbed by local politics kingdoms in the southeast coast of indian subcontinent had had established trade cultural and political relations with the southeast asian kingdoms in burma thailand indonesia malay peninsula the philippines cambodia and vietnam um this led to indianization and also sanskritization of southeast asia so you see you we had southern indian traders adventurers teachers and priests they continue to be Uh, a dominating influence in the southeast asian uh, communities until the 15th century and eventually you, as you can see most of the mainland states are buddhist today um, that's thanks to india and you see a huge influence of hinduism as well um, and it's quite fascinating to see how their cultures are very intertwined with uh, with ours so i can go on speaking on this topic until <laughs> i think that's enough <laughs> yeah and this is of course uh, india huge country 28 states eight union territories 121 languages as as per the indian register of general and census commissioner uh, lovely would you like to quickly talk about the different regions of uh, of india so um yeah kuntil as people can see the north india um is right on the top and it's it's very very diverse it's got the mountains the himalayas and the gangetic plains so geographically it's it's really beautiful and very fertile land ethnicity in north is very mixed because of the influences of central asia people not just assimilated um uh, culture but also intermarried and the races are all very mixed you'll see really Uh, white looking people in some parts of um, uh, northern india and wonder if they were really indian or european um they mostly wheat eaters except some exceptions are there of course um, but mostly wheat eaters i would say um, or let's say bread eaters rather than rice eaters and huge influence of central asian influence in clothing and some states uh, languages are more sanskritized then if you compare north with south 
south is of course i mean it's very very generic my my explanations uh, are very generic but um, just to give you an idea so uh, culturally they are supposed to have the um, uh, the original dravidian race which was there in india uh, from the beginning and their culture is very different uh, in some sense um they speak a language which doesn't have um, uh, well tamil is the main language there it is um one of the prominent states in southern india and it's said that it's older than sanskrit so their um uh, root in language is not sanskrit so it's different um but some other southern state languages of course are influenced by sanskrit um then they are mostly right rice eaters you see them wearing sarees and um uh, um uh, yeah dark skin uh, those are main differences really then um east india has mongolite influences because of its proximity to southeast asia mainly rice eaters and they love their fish um, no matter where you go they love their fish in the eastern part of india uh, and then in the western part you have mainly rajasthan that's the desert and gujarat so they were between they were really um uh, trading uh, sorry they were in between the bridge between central india and um, mainland india so they also have a huge western uh, central asian influence uh, in their culture and also largely um, bread eaters um, languages are also sanskritized close proximity to hindi uh, which is the national language um in order geographically so you have the deserts in the west you have the himalayas in the north you have a huge coastline in the south and the east has rainforests and some beautiful landscapes so there's a little bit for some but uh, for everybody there uh, whereas central india has the jungles largely um where where people come to see the tigers and other flora and fauna so central indian forests are really uh, uh, really good uh, that's just about it a very very basic uh, distinction between the regions right thank you lovely so yeah we have the highest we have the mountains the highest mountains we have the deserts we have the we have the forests we have the tribes uh, we have the coast and of course we have uh any other things to experience uh continuing with the webinar just hold on give me a moment yeah just some quick information uh best season to best season would be november to april uh visa e visas are available can be done online it is recommended to start the process 10 days before departure the cost of the e visa is there in front of you uh $25 american july to march and uh 10 uh, 10 american dollars april to june for vaccine or any other vaccination issues please consult your doctor so these are some of the pictures that i that you're going to see on this tour the golden triangle and the ranthambore tour i'm going to uh dwell on the different monuments and the other things the different destinations so here is the routing delhi agra ranthambore jaipur delhi this is going to be our routing and uh, this is a little map that you see here from delhi we go to agra and from agra to ranthambore and from ranthambore to jaipur and jaipur back to delhi okay so let me quickly talk about uh, the places that uh, uh, that's there on the itinerary delhi uh, delhi is india's capital city and in, is a major get, gateway into the country uh contemporary delhi today is truly cosmopolitan with its own unique heritage uh, which is a brilliant mix of mix uh, of the eight cities that were built here over the many centuries uh 
we have different monuments here like the red fort the jama masjid i'm going to talk about it in the later slides but that's really for you and then we have agra which is situated on the banks of the river yamuna and is home to many unesco world heritage sites including the taj mahal and then we have jaipur uh, the colorful city of jaipur is india's first planned city bustling markets historic buildings hidden temples all set against the backdrop of the magnificent amir fort and then we have ranthambore national park home to 71 royal bengal tigers it was once the hunting ground of the maharaja of jaipur delhi uh delhi for delhi we uh, recommend minimum two nights uh what does the delhi sightseeing entail uh, a morning sightseeing of old delhi where you visit the jama masjid later walk through the narrow winding lanes and a cycle rickshaw ride uh and you drive past mughal's empire's most opulent fort in india the red fort and the afternoon sightseeing of new delhi it's a full day tour you drive past some of the government buildings impressive government buildings built by the british raj and uh you end the day at the 12th century qutub minar so let me take you through delhi delhi sightseeing uh for clients arriving delhi on day one for clients arriving by a morning flight uh what can be done is we can take them to the humayun tomb in the afternoon this is an extraordinary piece of architecture built by a woman for a man this was built by the wife of the second mughal emperor humayun uh, after he died she decided to build this beautiful monument in his memory and in many ways this particular building has been the inspiration of the taj mahal uh, it has 53 gardens and the idea was to create an islamic version of heaven on earth as mentioned in the quran so this entire monument we have 53 gardens and we have the concept of char bagh char would mean four and bagh would means garden so this is char bagh is a four quadrant garden uh, divided into four parts and each part representing the four rivers of islamic paradise with pools and channels so the construction started in 1565 and it took 7 years to complete and i was in, i was doing a little bit of uh, research as to what happened in 1565 when this monument was built well here we go i mean what else happened in 1565 when the construction of this uh, exquisite monument began so the city of rio de janeiro was founded in the same year in brazil uh philippines philippines in southeast asia was colonized by the spanish in 1565 and uh, the oldest city of the usa saint augustine fla was established by the spanish in present day florida so that's 1565 for you what happened around the world along with the construction of this exquisite piece of architecture so we spent time in the humayun tomb and then we walk around the khan market which is close by it is the world's 20th most expensive retail space with a rent of 237 american dollars per square feet that's a 2019 rate i'm sure it has increased in 2020 we take a walk around this is a, a nice place with a very good vibe with a lot of shops and restaurants it's a good place to hang around so we do a little bit of walk here in the khan market and recommend you have a dinner at indian accent which is which has been voted as one of the best restaurants in the world a uh, lovely you had dinner there would you like to add something here yes kuntil this is one of the most celebrated um, indian uh, restaurants and if i am allowed to say that um, the only sort of michelin star level restaurant in india uh, they experiment with their uh, uh, with the indian cuisine and the chef manish um, is a dear friend of our md is really really sweet 
um, the food that they serve is world class and the experience of dining here is um, par excellence. So it's set in uh, the Lodi Hotel and uh, they're beautiful dining uh, spaces. The picture that you see is actually of a private dining room uh, which is surrounded by a water body. In the middle of that uh, is this private dining room. So if you have a small group, it's um, uh, great fun to reserve this area. And the waiting list is long, so you really have to book in advance uh, uh, to get a thing here. Uh, my, my favorite is the tasting menu where you get uh, um, a deconstructed samosa or uh, really um, a quirky uh, takes on the traditional Indian food. Um, so this is highly recommended. Uh, they have they have just turned the whole thing about Indian food upside down, isn't it lovely? Like yeah, the, the exactly. Deconstructed the Indian samosa, which is like, uh, which is almost like so normal, but they kind of deconstructed it completely. Very, very uh, amazing uh, experience out here. Highly recommended as the first place to dine out on day one. Uh, this is for clients who are arriving by the morning flight. Normally, some of clients arrive at um, 11 o'clock at night on day one, so they can't do my room or uh, these things, but yes. This is for clients who arrive on a morning flight on day one. Uh, day two, uh, we start our day by a sightseeing of Old Delhi. This is a full day tour today, day two. So we start our day at Jama Masjid, which is the largest mosque in India. A very impressive piece of Mughal architecture built with red sandstone and it can accommodate up to 25,000 people, 25,000 people can pray at the same time here, just that big. Um, the construction started in 1644 and uh, it ended in 1656. So we're going to spend time at uh, the Jamba Mosque and then we can, we'll walk around the narrow, uh, the narrow lands of, uh, narrow lanes of uh, Old Delhi, uh, colorful shops and um, each lane is dedicated to a particular particular thing for example kinari bazaar as you can read from the signboard here kinari bazaar is where everyone in delhi goes to shop if there is a wedding in the family so there are many alleys like that we'll walk around in the alleys for a bit and also do a cycle rickshaw ride through the narrow lanes and then we'll drive past and then we'll end our old daily tour and then we'll get into our vehicles and we'll drive past Red Fort where the 105 carat Kohinoor diamond was a part of the royal throne and now it owns the crown of the Queen of England. So we'll drive past the Red Fort, we'll drive past the Connaught Place, which was once a popular partridge hunting zone for the locals. Before the British Raj built a commercial hub here, we'll drive past uh, the Connaught Place. Uh, we'll drive past the India Gate, we'll get one of the biggest war memorials of the world and uh, drive past the Rashtrapati Bhavan, the second largest residence of, of a head of the state in the world. It has more than 300 rooms. Uh, and then this is where we end our day, Kutub Minar, where an iron pillar been standing tall without rusting for over 200 years. So Kutub Minar, it's a 12th century monument. Uh, it's the tallest brick tower in the world, 73 meters tall. Uh, in many ways, Kutub Minar signaled the arrival of political Islam in North India. As Lavalin was saying that the two ways Islam came into India. Uh, in South of India, Islam came in peace to trade. They were looking for spices. So they came in, uh, they came in peace, they traded, and they went away in peace. But in North, they came as hordes of invaders. The plunder, the loot was going on in North India and they arrived from the North. Uh, that's how Islam arrived. And they used to come, plunder, loot, and leave. But in the 12th century, the one of the slaves of an invader, he decided, let me stay here and let me kind of rule over here. So that's how it all started. Uh, political Islam in India started and this tower is a commemoration of that and uh, 
this is where we end our sightseeing of Delhi and we go back to our hotel overnight and get ready for our journey to Agra the next day. So Delhi to Agra, we take uh, the train, uh, which is the Gatiman Express. Uh, it's India's, supposed to be India's fastest train. It departs at 8.10 in the morning and arrives to Agra at 9.50. Uh, upon arrival in Agra, we'll proceed for the sightseeing of Agra. And what to see in Agra, that's the Gatiman Express train for you. That's a little uh, photograph of the coach there where our clients will travel. It's the executive class. And what to see in Agra? Agra, one night in Agra, um, sightseeing. Upon arrival, we proceed for sightseeing of Taj Mahal and Agra Fort. Uh, Agra Fort. Uh, well, Agra Fort is definitely the finest, one of the finest Mughal forts in India. But this is an interesting story. Uh, Agra Fort was the center of British resistance during the mutiny of 1857. And um, the actions of Jonathan Small a guard at the fort during the incident was actually the inspiration behind Arthur Conan Doyle's, the person who created Sherlock Holmes novel, The Sign of Four, where Sherlock Holmes was investigating about a stolen treasure, a secret pact among four convicts, which is why four the title, and the two corrupt prison, prison guards. So Agra Fort has actually inspired Arthur Conan Doyle to write The Sign of Four and um, Sherlock Holmes investigating a lost treasure. So yeah, one of the finest Mughal forts in India, which is surrounded by a 2.5 kilometer long wall with many imposing gates, pavilions, courtyards, gardens, and mosques inside. It was built in 1505 and the construction was finished in 1573. It stands over 94 acres of land. Right, so that's Agra Fort for you. Sometimes the slide doesn't move. Okay, the Taj Mahal, an extraordinary piece of architecture built by a man for a woman. Uh, what do I say about the Taj Mahal? You have to come and see the Taj Mahal. Otherwise, seeing is believing. No picture does justice to the Taj Mahal. It is the jewel of Mughal architecture, if I may say. Built in 1632, took about 22 years to complete. And if someone has to construct the Taj Mahal in 2020, it will cost him one billion dollars. So that's the valuation. That's what was it was calculated. So that's Taj Mahal. We'll spend time at the Taj Mahal during sunset and uh, get ready for our journey to Ranthambhor the next day. Okay, so the journey to Ranthambhor entails the drive to Bharatpur and from Bharatpur we are going to take a uh, train to Ranthambhor. So this morning we are going to uh, drive to Bharatpur railway station. En route we will uh, stop at Fatehpur Sikri, a very interesting place and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, once the capital of the Mughals and was abandoned. After the sightseeing at Fatehpur Sikri is over. We drive to Bharatpur for lunch at the hotel. And then we board the Jan Shatabdi train to Sawai Madhapur, which is the railway station of Rantapur. Our train leaves at 15.50 and arrives Sawai Madhapur railway station at 18.02 hours. Uh, this is Fatehpur Sikri for you. Obscure, lost, but a perfectly preserved ghost town. It was built by one of the Mughal emperors uh, we did a fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic in terms of architecture, uh, built in red sandstone, but he forgot about, forgot to take care of one thing, the availability of water. Soon the water ran out and he had to abandon this particular capital of his and shift his capital to Lahore in present day uh, Pakistan. So we're going to spend time at Fatehpur Sikri, uh, go through uh, the palace and the courtyards 
the gardens, it's beautiful out there, perfectly preserved. And then we have lunch at Bharatpur and go to the Bharatpur railway station to board the train to Ranthambore, Savai Madhapur railway station. That's your train to uh, uh, Savai Madhapur, the closest railhead to uh, uh, Ranthambore National Park. And this is how your uh, how the coach looks like from inside. Ranthambore, two nights. So we spend two nights in Ranthambore. Uh, one can enjoy early morning and afternoon jungle safari using the forest jeeps, maximum six packs of canters, 20 packs. One natural is provided each jeep or canter. So day five and six will be spent in search of the Royal Bengal tiger. There are 71 tigers in the Ranthambore National Park. May I invite our uh, wildlife expert on the panel, Surya, to talk a little bit about the Ranthambore National Park. Uh, Surya? Sure. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, Surya. Yes, great. So thank you, Kuntal. Uh, Basically, I think uh, after Delhi and Agra, for me, a wildlife guy, this will be a welcome break uh, to go into the parks morning and evening. So, Ranthambore, you can say, can we consider to be like an oasis in the desert? As most of you might know, it, Rajasthan is overall one of the driest parts of the country. So, Ranthambore, because it was the hunting ground of the Maharajas, uh, there was a lot of uh, water holes built uh, and large water tanks constructed inside the park overlooking the fort. So the majestic Ranthambore Fort, which was built somewhere around the 6th and 7th century, uh, overlooks the entire park. And you can still see the ruins of the fort and how the park has grown around this abandoned structure. And with these lakes, what has happened is this has turned into an oasis for wildlife. Uh, even in the drier months, there is water availability for most of the wildlife. And uh, what we generally do is uh, we enter the parks at first light and you generally have about three and a half hours in the morning and uh, about three and a half hours to four hours in the afternoon. And as you can see in, in the image here, uh, you go by open jeeps and uh, it might seem strange that we drive the roads and we expect to see a tiger in such a dense wooded country. So what uh, generally happens is uh, the drivers and the guides are very, very good at uh, finding or knowing to, uh, the way to find the cats. So basically, we look for the signs in the jungle, like tracks. You look here, listen for sounds of animals which give an alarm when they see a big cat, like a tiger moving around. So you have like uh, uh, langur monkeys and spotted deer, which raise an alarm when a tiger is walking through the forest. So that is how we are able to pinpoint the location of the cat. And of course, there is one interesting thing that the tiger does, which other cats in the world seldom do, which is that the tigers go and sit in water to cool off in the hotter times of the day. So this is a big advantage, especially in a park like Ranthambo, which is overall dry, except for these large water tanks. So there is, that increases the chances of seeing tigers, especially closer towards the warmer months. Uh, it is very, very hard to explain how uh, it feels when you see a tiger. I still remember the first tiger I saw, this is about, I think, 12 years ago. And I've seen many tigers after that, but it's been quite memorable and you can always recollect how you saw your first tiger even if, if even if I close my eyes today and uh, it is one of the most unique wilderness experiences in the world I've seen uh, uh, lions in Africa I've seen leopards but I think I would put uh, seeing a tiger as something quite on par with something like seeing a snow leopard or going for a polar bear in the Arctic it is one of the most must-do experiences in the world. And when you talk about Ranthambore and tigers, it is not just the big cats that you'll be looking for every day throughout. You will, of course, have an opportunity to go come across other wildlife. You have the sloth bear or the balu, as people know it from the Jungle Book. You have leopards. Uh, you have a, two, three different kinds of deer in the park. And Ranthambore, in fact, for people who are interested in birds, has recorded over 400 different bird species. And for those who are keen, and there are, most of the naturalists in the park do know their birds because of the number of wildlife uh, people who are keen on wildlife who come there. So it is a very good uh, potpourri of uh, wilderness experiences that is put together to form this park. And also one of the interesting things that I like to do between the drives, if the weather permitting, and if uh, the people are keen to walk, is go up the fort, uh, the Ranthambore fort, which I was talking about earlier, because 
you may be interested in history, may not be interested in history, but it is quite spectacular to just climb the steps uh, to the top of the fort, simply because you get an aerial view of a national park, which is something which one seldom gets to do unless you're on a hot air balloon in Africa or something. But here, just by walking, it takes about half an hour climbing the steps to the top. And there is a small temple which people visit. And so the, temp uh, the fort is open through the day for the people who go to the temple. So people like us who just want to go to the top to experience the fort and experience the views from the top of all the water tanks. And in fact, I've had one or two instances where I have seen tigers from the top of the fort. So it is quite an experience. There's a lot to do over there. And, uh, and it, the beauty of the whole thing is you can quite get in quite easily from the popular spa spots like Agra and Jaipur. Uh, so just by like, like Kuntal was saying, you can catch a train from Bharatpur and then you're in Ranthambore in no time staying in a good place. And then you're picked up from your hotel for your drives. Uh, definitely highly recommended. And I think Ranthambore makes the golden triangle a beautiful golden quadrilateral. Um, thank you. But, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Surya. Right. So yeah, this is just to give you an idea of how the Jeeps look like. Uh, we'll talk about the other nitty gritties in a short while. This is the canter for bigger groups. Uh, this is the Ranthambo Ford that uh, Surya was talking about. And uh, what I find really, really, uh, I remember my first visit to the Ranthambo Ford and what I really was astonished for the first time, it's probably uh, 15 years ago. I, this was my first visit to the Ranthambo uh, Fort and the park and I was astonished to see that there's a Ganesha temple inside. I mean, probably some of you are aware of uh, the Hindu god Ganesha, which who has a elephant head, the elephant headed Hindu god, he's our most beloved god. And there's a Ganesha temple inside and locals offer the first invitation card of any wedding to Ganesha. He's the first one to be invited because he's also considered to be someone who removed all obstacles. So any local wedding here, in and around, people come, the first invitation goes to Ganesha. I've seen this inside a temple and I was really, really astonished for the, when I saw it for the first time. So that's the Ranthabo National Park, uh, Ranthabo Fort, which we already said. Uh, if, you, if you want to see it, it's a great way to go and spend some time here, apart from doing the safaris in Ranthabo. Uh, here are some um, details that I'm going to read out. Uh, timings of the safari, you can see it's there on your screen. Uh, it's very, it's, it varies from a month, different months from October to February, March to April, May to June, the different timings, uh, the morning safaris and the afternoon safaris. There are 10 zones where the safaris takes place. Zone one to five is considered good for sighting, but then this is just perception that sighting is good everywhere. Uh, Jeeps can go to all zones, the big canters which you saw that where the groups are can go to can go to zone one to six and nine and ten only. The park closes on July first and opens October first. Monsoon safaris happens on zone seven to ten, July to September. But well, uh, very very uh, can get cancelled in the last moment or uh, uh, the roads are very bumpy, slushy, muddy. So we don't recommend a monsoon safaris. But it's just good to know. Uh, booking opens three sixty five days before on a first come first serve basis. So if you have the passport details of clients, please send it to us as soon as possible. Uh, clients have to ensure that they carry the same passport on which the safari is booked, even if they get a new one issued. There are 140 vehicles in total, so you can understand that the, the vehicles are limited who apply on a rooster. All bookings are on a non-refundable basis. Once a zone is alloc allocated, the Jeep or the canter can move around only in the particular zone, not in any other zone. There's maximum six packs in one zone, maximum 20 packs in one canter, the, the bigger vehicle. Uh, one naturalist per Jeep canter who are allocated as per a rooster by the government. Uh, one can opt for a better naturalist, of course, by paying an extra supplement. Uh, your uh, relationship manager will guide you through the nitty gritties of this, how to get a, a better naturalist, like Surya, of course. Uh, Camera fee still video not included and has to be paid on spot. There is a concept of free zone where there's only five zips, maximum four in each zip, where you can move around in all the zones, be it the half day, six hours or the full day. 
sunrise to sunset with pack lunch in the free zone. It's quite an expensive one, comes from an extra supplement. You can move around in all the zones of the park, full either half day, six hours or full day, sunrise to sunset. Are exclusive safaris possible? Yes, exclusive safaris are possible. For example, if two, pick, two packs agree to pay for all the six packs in the Jeep, it becomes an exclusive safari. And here's the tipping, the driver and the naturalist do expect tips and it's totally up to the clients. Rupees 300 for the driver and rupees 600 for drive is recommended. So yeah, so um, Ranthambur to Jaipur. So we do a morning safari before leaving to Jaipur uh, uh, in search of the Royal Bengal Tiger. And we drive to Jaipur for four hours, which takes four hours. We check into your hotel, we check into the hotel and remainder of the time is at leisure. So today in Jaipur, uh, we recommend you have dinner at Suvarna Mahal at Taj Rambad. Lovely and you talk about a little bit about Taj Rambad? Yes, uh, um, uh, Kuntil, Taj Rambad is uh, the most iconic hotel in India and um, as most people will agree with me, uh, one of my favorites um, and many people's favorites in India. Um, it is managed by the Taj Group. It was an erstwhile uh, palace of uh, uh, Maharani Gayatri Devi lived here. Uh, most people know of Maharani Gayatri Devi. She was uh, married to the Maharaja of Jaipur. And this was her home, which was opened um, into um, the hotel. And, and one of the first uh, heritage hotels to open um, by any royalty. Um, and beautifully managed by the Taj group today. This Suvarna Mahal um, has, uh, as you can see, how the interiors uh, take you back in time and the dining experience here is really beautiful very very grand um, the thali dinner is highly recommended so you order like a, a platter and um, beautifully arrayed dishes come on a serving platter and um, uh, that's your meal and it has a little bit of everything so there would be um, a platter for yourself. That's what we call a thali. And you can mix and match and have your own dinner. And traditional Rajasthani cuisine is what they serve from the royal kitchens of the palace. Um, if you have the budget, if your guests have the budget, this is a must stay. Um, Somebody is asking me approximate cost of the meals. Uh, so I, I wouldn't know right now, but yes, it would be... Um, uh, roughly 5,000 rupees plus plus. Um, but we are going to take up questions at the end. So may I request yeah. everybody to post your questions in the Q&A yeah. and we will take up the questions at the end. Thank so, you. So we recommend dinner at Suvarna Mahal at Taj Rambag or what you can also do is check out some local favorites at LMB which is also a Jaipur institution. Um, uh, Sanjay, can I ask you to come in and talk a little bit about LMB, which is no less iconic? Yeah, hi Kuntal, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so LMB is the very first restaurant of Jaipur. Basically, it was a sweet shop earlier and then extended into a restaurant. It is situated into the wall city and the food out here is really very good. The food is not uh, something... Uh, continental, it comes uh, basically Rajasthani cuisine. So here also you can try either some snacks, which are very famous, which is local snacks, and the thali, which comes a royal uh, cuisine of Rajasthan, which is called dal, bati, and churma. So dal, it is liltons, which are made uh, in different ways, and bati is a uh, uh, flour ball, which is uh, roasted, and churma is a sweet dish to it. So a uh, nice place. It's a vegetarian to go and visit and experience. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kuntal. So you can check out some of the local favorites, what locals eat. They come here. It's a very good place. Authentic food. Nice, clean. You can definitely enjoy one of my favorite places in Jaipur. Or you can take lessons on Rajasthani cuisine. They, they, we have... Uh, Many cooking classes we have uh, tied up with many families. They give you lessons on Rajasthani cuisine where you can do a hands-on cooking workshop like this and have dinner with the family and come back. 
So these are the three options on, on the day you arrive from Ranthambore. And uh, Jaipur, of course, two nights. Uh, and the sightseeing of Jaipur entails a visit to the City Palace Museum and uh, followed by Jantar Mantar and uh, Amir Fort, which is the peace of the resistance of, uh, of uh, Jaipur in the afternoon. In all the itineraries, you must have noticed, all of you must have noticed that Amir Fort is always in the beginning, always in the morning, uh, half and City Palace and Jantar Mantar is in the afternoon. But what we have done is we have tweaked the sightseeing where we will visit the city palace and the museum uh, in the morning. Uh, and then we will visit the Amir Fort in the afternoon. Uh, this is done with a purpose. Sanjay, can I ask you to come and uh, just explain why we have done this? Yeah, hi Quintel, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, Amir Fort in traditional way was always included in the morning tour because there was the elephant ride which people used to take. So elephant used to take the tourist shops to the fort and that was only available in the morning. Over the period of time, it has been uh, on the animal, animal purility, people have decided not to ride the elephants and go up to the fort. So the best way of doing is sightseeing to take out the Amir and do it in the afternoon and do the morning tour of city. This edge you gives you a benefit. One, you don't have to start early in the morning from your hotel. You can have your breakfast later and enjoy your holiday. B, there will be no traffic jams which is caused by the jeeps. Because if you are not taking the elephant ride and you are going up to the fort by Jeeves, there is a very narrow road which leads from the backside of the old city of Amir and takes you up to the fort. So there is a huge queue and jam, jam happens during the morning. Then there will be a less crowd in all the monuments where you will visit because we are doing the sightseeing reverse. 90% of the tourists, they go and visit Amir in the morning because of the elephant ride. So you will have the less crowd and less people in the rest of the monument. Absolutely. It also it also gives a flexibility to include any kind of a experience during the tour of Jeff. Thank you, Quentin. Right. right. Thank you, Sanjay. Yeah. So uh, day seven we start with the tour the city pass. Uh, this uh, the city palace has four small gates, and for me, this is uh, this is big highlight. It has four small gates, which that represents the four seasons of the year. Great place for photographs and also selfies out here. It has the these gates, which represents four seasons of the year. Um, city palace, uh, it's was constructed the same time as the city uh, of. Uh, Jaipur, which is in this first plan city, as I said in the beginning, it was constructed during the same time uh, in 1727. And um, there is a museum out there which has a rare collection of manuscripts, armory, textiles, carpets, and miniature painting. The textile section is uh, really impressive, and that's where you get to hear all the stories. Uh, it's very impressive, and uh, this is where. One needs to spend more time there, the textile. And one of the fav favorite stories that um, of mine uh, in the textile gallery is why people of Rajasthan dress in different colors in different season. I won't uh, tell you more, but this is the kind of stories that you get to hear in the textile section, why people from Rajasthan dress, dress in different colors in different seasons and many more stories. So the textile section is very interesting here. Uh, the royal family also stays here in the city palace, but in a different section, which is uh, not, which is uh, where tourists are not allowed. Uh, from the city palace, we go to the royal observatory, which has the world's biggest stone sundial. Uh, this is also UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is the most significant, most comprehensive, and the best preserved historic observatory of India. So we spend time here. And then we break for lunch, 
or we stroll in a local bazaar where the Maharaja of Jaipur invited artisans and craftsmen from all over India, gave them tax holidays to, uh, in, modern, mo in the modern lingo, tax holidays. Um, they were given tax holidays and were invited from all over India to set up shop by the Maharaja of Jaipur when he was building India's first planned city. So we stroll around in the local bazaar for a while and then we have lunch and then we go to Amir Fort, uh, beautiful fort of Rajasthan. Uh, it has a Shish Mahal, which is a hall of mirrors, which could be illuminated with a single candle. So Amer Fort is again a very, very opulent hilt of Fort of Rajasthan. It has, it's a unique mix of, uh, of Hindu and Muslim architecture. Uh, it was the residence of the Maharajas of Jaipur for nearly 700 years before they, before they shifted to the city palace. Inside the fort, you have pretty palaces, very imposing gates like this one, as you can see. And you have several buildings decorated with beautiful mural paintings, mirror work, uh, and other decorations. So a very good place to spend uh, your time there and the right way to end your day in Jaipur. Uh, we stop. On our way back to the hotel, we stop for a photo, uh, photo op here. It is the Hawa Mahal, an iconic Hawa Mahal, probably one of the most photographed uh, monuments in Rajasthan. Uh, we stop here quickly, take a picture and move on. It, has, it was designed for the royal ladies to see the processions on the streets below. Um, they could see, but people couldn't see them. There, there, were, there are 953 small windows here and it's called the Palace of Winds. So this is, we quickly stop here for a photo and then we continue for a hotel to overnight. Uh, day eight, Jaipur, Delhi home. Uh, we drive to Delhi, either five hours or fly to Delhi, 60 minutes to board the flight back home. Uh, day use rooms at the Aero City can be booked depending on the flight timing. So day eight, you drive to Delhi and board your flight back home or one can spend two more nights relaxing in any of the following properties located in the Rajasthan countryside before heading to Delhi on day 10. Uh, one is Samod Palace, which is 400 year old Samod Palace. It is just 45 minutes from Jaipur and four hours, 30 minutes from Delhi. Lovelyn, can I uh, ask you to speak a little bit about these two properties, starting with Samod Palace? Yeah, uh, thanks Kuntil. So Samud Palace um, was restored. It was the erstwhile residence of uh, Rawal, um, which is an aristocrat of the Jaipur, uh, um, with allegiance to the Jaipur royal family. So the aristocrat or the Rawal as they're called, um, this was their residence and it's in the heart of a beautiful village surrounded by hills. Uh, 45 minutes away from Jaipur on the way to Delhi. Um, this is a perfect um, getaway because it's really beautifully restored. It's a heritage home uh, with two pools, one roof, uh, one like infinity pool on the rooftop and there's another pool at another level. Um, the hotel is really beautiful because um, its traditional architecture uh, makes it really, really quaint with these different courtyards um, and how the rooms were in the olden times. They've tried to restore it and bring modernity and modern facility. Um, uh, there's also an elevator in one place, but there, mind you, there are plenty of steps. Um, but it's a very relaxed atmosphere in the middle of nowhere if you want to get away from the madding crowds of a city and just enjoy a beautiful property with um, excellent service and the food is really good here. They serve all kinds of cuisines. Um, their Western cuisine is really uh, nice. Uh, and also Indian cooking uh, is home style uh, cooking. So it's not what you would find in uh, restaurants with which are overloaded with spices. It's really mild and nice. Um, so this is one of our favorite and preferred hotels. And they, the, the incentive industry uses it Hugely also because they do a beautiful gala dinner with fireworks and 
um, you know, a procession through the village with camel carts and horses and creating, recreating the regalia of the old time. So if you have a large group and you want to end your tour with one grand gala evening, this is the place to do it. Okay, thank Kundil, you. Uh, yeah. yeah. And let's then let's look at um, Amman Bagh now. Uh, huh? yeah. So Amman Bagh is actually um, somewhere between Agra and uh, uh, Jaipur. So uh, uh, and also I and as in you can see the distances uh, given at the at the bottom of the slide. Um, Amman Bagh uh, is a newly built hotel. Most people know. Aman level of luxury and um, service. Uh, so very luxurious uh, accommodation uh, with plunge pools, uh, et cetera. So uh, private plunge pools in some of the cottages um, that they have. So it's a resort, um, more like a resort, a small boutique resort. Again, in the middle of nowhere, in wilderness, it's also a perfect get getaway. Um, uh, with close proximity to both Agra and Jaipur, uh, and also Delhi, it's kind of distance from all, so it's it's a very good um, uh, uh, way to end. Um, depending on wherever you're ending your tour, you can actually get here very easily. So it's uh, proximity to your Golden Triangle makes it very viable destination to end and just relax and enjoy the beauty of rural India in Serenity. Uh, the attraction here is also um, a beautiful haunted uh, little village um, that you like to village. And uh, an entire abandoned city is um, something that you can go and see and have a little picnic. The hotel organizes um, uh, free dining, so you can actually eat anywhere you want in the property. They have a little uh, kitchen garden where they grow their own organic herbs, so that's something interesting to see as well. Um, the property is managed really well and they take good care of you. So uh, this is also highly recommended. For us. Yeah, and, and both these two properties have one common thread. It's like magic in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. 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 Thank you, lovely. Yeah, so we're going to uh, talk about the preferred hotels here uh, very quickly. Uh, we have kind of categorized it into luxury, deluxe, first class, and smart budget. Luxury would be superb accommodation with facilities and services to match. Deluxe would be a high standard of accommodation with a wide range of facilities. First class, a good standard of accommodation, reasonable ra range of facilities. And smart budget would be comfortable accommodation but limited facilities. So this is our luxury hotel in Delhi, which is it's imperial, uh, iconic hotel of Delhi. Uh, in the luxury section, then we have deluxe hotels in Delhi which is the Taj Palace. Uh, then we have in first class, we have the Surya. Uh, and then smart budget, we have the Royal Plaza in New Delhi with a great location. Uh, for Adra, we have uh, the Amar Bilas in the luxury category. Deluxe would be ITC Mughal. First class would be Hilton Doubletree. These are preferred hotels. Uh, and the smart budget in Agra would be Clark Shiraj. Uh, Ranthambore, luxury hotel would be uh, Bandia Bilas of the Obroy Group. Then we have in the deluxe category, we have the Sawai Bilas in Ranthambore. Uh, in first class, we would have the Ranthambore Agency. And in smart budget, we have the Abhayaran, which is Ranthambore for you. And Jaipur, in uh, the luxury section, we have the Taj Ramba which have been talked about. We have the Jaipur Marriott in the deluxe category. Uh, the first class hotels in Jaipur would be ITC Raj Bhutana and smart budget would be Sarovar Premier. Uh, quickly to take you through the transportation, um, we have Audis. We have access to total six vehicles, two packs maximum here. Uh, then we have Toyota Innovas, uh, three packs minimum, a uh, maximum allowed. And we have access to about 120 vehicles for the Innovas. Uh, then for three to five packs maximum, we have the Mercedes Viano. The total eight vehicles uh, that we have access to, which meet our standards. And I say access to vehicles means access to vehicles which meet our standards. 
Then we have the Toyota highest commuter, four to six packs maximum. We have access to total eight vehicles. Then we have the Tempo Traveler, four to seven packs maximum. We have access to about total 40 vehicles. Uh, then we have the Toyota Coaster, six to 10 packs maximum. Uh, we have access to total eight vehicles, eight Toyota Coaster. Then we have the Mini Coach, eight to 14 packs maximum. So we have access to total 27 such vehicles. And then we have the large coaches, 41 sitter, which we offer to 14 to 34 packs maximum. We have access to 24 such buses, large coaches. And then there are 45 sitters, which we offer to 16 to 41 packs maximum. Uh, again, we have access to 24 such vehicles that meet our standards. Uh, thank you. We are now ready to take your questions.